Dear colleague, welcome to this session being part of the Golf PCR 2020 meeting. This session is entitled What You Need to Know About DAPT in HBR Patients. And this will be an educational session mainly on case-based uh, discussion. My name is Thomas Cuisset and I'm very happy to be here today with my colleagues and friends, Dr. Alasnak, Dr. Smith and Dr. Val Gimigli. And without further introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alasnag, who will give us an overview about the, let's say, the HBR situation in the Middle East region. Please. Well, thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. And um, I've been delegated to go over the landscape of bleeding risk in the Gulf region in our patients that we treat in the cath lab. And interestingly, we actually don't look into it uh, very carefully. Um, I don't have any disclosures relevant to this, but a lot of the times, because our population is young, we tend to make the assumption that they are, in fact, low risk. So let us just quickly go over the data that we have available to us. And if we look at the e-Ultimaster registry that looked at um, the Middle East compared to the rest of the world, um, the uh, only four out of 12 criteria were uh, available. And approximately in the Middle East region, 25 to 30% as opposed to the rest of the world, 35 to 40% uh, qualify as high bleeding risk. If we look specifically at the Gulf region, um, there are a few publications. One is the STARS-1 program uh, that looked at the clinical characteristics and management and outcomes representative of acute MIs in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, so this is a very select population, but when we do look at them, um, and we see the age was around 55. I'm sorry, I moved too fast. Um, but the age was 55, but the rate of uh, other co comorbidities such as stroke and so on was in fact low. And when you look at the different medications that these patients are likely to be on in terms of high bleed that can render them high bleeding risk, um, the more common uh, antiplatelet that's used is actually aspirin and clopidogrel. Tachygrelor is very low in use in both STEMI and non-STEMIs. Another one, the Gulf Race 2, looked at multiple country, uh, countries in the Gulf region. Once again, when you look at the baseline characteristics uh, of these patients, the average age was similar. It was around 56 to 57 years old. But once again, other comorbidities such as stroke, chronic kidney dysfunction, et cetera, were in fact very low. And finally, another uh, uh, registry, and this again, once again, confirmed uh, the, the use of um, antiplatelets is more likely to be clopidogrel and aspirin as opposed to the more potent uh, antiplatelet agents. And the final um, registry that I'm looking at here is the Gulf Coast registry uh, that looked at acute coronary syndrome in these patients in our population. And once again, stroke, TIAs, et cetera, were very low, and the use of warfarin was very low, as you can see in the right-hand uh, chart. So overall, um, aside from uh, age, our patients, the majority are, in fact, low risk, the ones that end up coming and getting catheterization. Um, so it's probably a selection bias, and we're probably less likely to cath patients that are high risk in our part of the world. I'll end here and probably turn over to Marco, who's going to discuss this in a little more depth. Thank you, Mirvat. Very interesting to see uh, the, the situation in the in the Gulf. And indeed, before going to practical cases, uh, it's my pleasure to to introduce Marco Valgimigli, who will give us a, a, a talk about the the HBR evidence and how to integrate that into our into our practice. Marco, thank you, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, Mirvat. A privilege for me to try to do so. So my task is to walk you through the drivers of the APT duration. And I really would like to force myself to be as practice oriented as possible. At the end of the day, to make things simple, we can say that there are two drivers, one being the ischemic and the, the other one being the bleeding risk. However, among the two, what uh, matters the most is by far the bleeding risk. Why should we give priority to the bleeding risk? Well, because if bleeding risk is high, we know that we need to go short, even if ischemic risk is concomitantly high. If the bleeding risk is low, we need to go long, and this is especially true in patients in whom the ischemic risk is also high. Why is this the case? Well, simply because in HBR patients, even if the ischemic risk is high, that risk, and this is really extremely important point, is simply not modifiable by prolonging the APT duration. And in fact, the evidence shows that the ischemic risk can even go higher if you prolong the APT in high bleeding risk patients. 
This is, to the best of my knowledge, the best piece of evidence we should leverage on. I need to acknowledge a big bias because this study is coming from my group, but I think this study is really a great summary. This is a pooled analysis of five different RCTs comparing short, either three or more frequently six months DAPT with respect to prolonged DAPT at least one year. And the population is stratified based on the bleeding as well as the ischemic risk. What you show here is very simply that if you prolong DPT in patients in whom the bleeding risk is high, you would uh, hesitate in a huge uh, bleeding excess. If you do the same exercise in patients in whom the bleeding risk is not high, then the bleeding risk would not increase that dramatically. But the important point is the ischemia component in the middle of this, of this box. If you prolong DPT in patients in whom the, ischemic, the bleeding risk is high, the ischemic risk will actually not be better, will be even worse. If you prolong DPT in patients in whom the ischemic bleeding is low, sorry, the bleeding risk is low and the ischemic risk is high, then, of course, you would hesitate, you would lead in a huge benefit favoring prolonged DPT over short-term DAPT. So, uh, of course, the key point now is to uh, agree on what we considered ischemic risk coverage and bleeding risk coverage. This is my executive summary, and of course, this should be discussed among us. But to me, the key point is clinical presentation. Uh, ACS, N versus CCS, and if ACS, how many prior ACS has this patient experienced before? Complex PCI has been clearly shown to be a treatment modifier. And to me, this is a, the reason because simply it's an easy marker for the complexity of atherosclerotic disease. So most likely, uh, Sinta score could pre perhaps do the same job, but simply we don't have the data for the Sinta score. Also important is the number of diseased vascular districts, which has been shown to be actually a treatment modifier in some of the available studies. On the other hand, the bleeding risk, well, we have have now two potentially complementary systems now to stratify the bleeding risk. One is a score, which is called precise DAPT score. The other one is actually not a score, but is a framework for defining in a dichotomized manner patient in whom the bleeding risk is high versus those in whom the bleeding risk is not high. Now, very quickly, the precise DPT, as I was telling you before, is formally a score which integrates only five readily available coverage, including prior bleeding, white blood cell count, age, creatinine clearance, and hemoglobin goes from zero to 100. And as long as it is at least 25, identifies patient in whom the bleeding risk is high. You can calculate that with a nomogram or if you will, with an online available calculator. The philosophy behind the Academic Research Consortium HBR uh, definition is slightly different. The idea is not to have a score, but rather some markers of high bleeding risk status. The markers, as are shown here, including age, renal disease, liver disease, active cancer, anemia, thrombocytopenia, stroke, bleeding diathesis, prior bleeding or transfusion, need for oral anticoagulation, concomitant and chronic treatment with NZ or corticosteroids, and finally, planned surgery on the APT or recent trauma or surgery. These criteria have been labeled as either major or minor, and sometimes both depending on the severity of the condition. Now, the good news here is that we have had some uh, recent validation of this score, and we were part of one. And actually what we saw, it's that our life can be actually relatively simple with this HBR framework, because what we saw that all major and the majority, minority, majority sorry, of minor HBR criteria identified actually in isolation patients at high bleeding risk. And in particular, in fact, age, mild anemia and mild CKD, the so-called minor criteria according to the original definition, identified in our very large population in isolation, 65% of the overall bleeding events observed within one year and did not confer lower bleeding risk than the so-called major uh, criteria. Now, 
if and when we speak about patients in whom there is a formal indication to oral anticoagulation, I think we need to be careful and I think we need to consider this patient separately and we need to have separate evidence. The good news is that we do have separate studies focusing on this patient population and here these four important studies with four different NOAC have been pulled together. The message here is quite simple. If you embrace a dual antithrombotic therapy consisting of a NOAC plus a P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy, mainly clopidogrel, I need to state here, as, and you compare this treatment strategy with a classical triple antithrombotic therapy, of course, you have a massive bleeding risk reduction. But if you pull all these four studies together, you have a somewhat higher ischemic risk to pay in terms of myocardial infarction as well as stent thrombosis. And the new piece of evidence here is that clinical presentation per se does not seem to be a treatment modifier. What I mean is that both in ACS and CCS patients, you have a bleeding benefit that I, I was showing you before, but in both patients' category, you have a slight excess of ischemic risk with respect to MI and stent thrombosis one. Now, what is still missing in the puzzle? What do we still critically need to learn in the upcoming months or years? I think we need to answer two very critical questions. One is, can short-term DPT be one month instead of few months? Because in all these studies I was showing you before, outside the OAC space, short-term DPT was three, but in actually most of them was six months DPT. And if we go down to one month, will one month possibly unveil a major trade-off in ischemic risk, especially among patients in whom there is ACS presentation or complex PCI? These two questions are, of course, interconnected, but very critically to be addressed. And I'm very happy to close by saying there's Hopefully, both questions will be answered and addressed by a major study, which is the master DAPT, which is unique in many features, including the sample size. The study is really properly powered to possibly detect even minor differences in ischemic events between the two groups but also because we have no exclusion criteria in this study. As long as the patient is HBR, irrespective of the concomitant ischemic condition, and as long as the patient is receiving complete revascularization at discretion of the treating physician with ultimaster stent implantation, the patient can get into the study and will be randomized and was randomized because in fact, inclusion is completed to only one month of DPT followed by single antiplatelet therapy or a slightly prolongation of DPT consisting of at least three or six months, depending on whether the patient has or does not have indication to oral anticoagulation. This study will be really important to clarify these two last issues. And with that said, I give the word back to you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Marco, for this very nice, short, and, and mainly practical uh, use of the available uh, evidence uh, evidence today. So after the situation in the region, the, the review of the evidence, I think now we can move to, to practice. And really, uh, I know that Mirvat has very nice and challenging cases to share with us. And I think that will be very good to see how we move from the evidence you described, Marco, to the, let's say, case-by-case -case, uh, decision. So Mirvat, now we can, we can move to the case, please. Thank you. So I'll start with the first case. Um, again, I don't have any relevant disclosures uh, with this case. Um, and these are actually patients that were enrolled in the master adapt uh, trial. So um, fortunately, I didn't have to think about the DAPT regimen and it was randomized. So uh, that made my, my work easy, but it's a difficult decision uh, outside the setting of an, of an investigation. So the first patient is actually an 80-year-old gentleman who, uh, whose risk factors include diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. His comorbidities include chronic kidney disease, um, not on dialysis, and peripheral vascular disease. He's also known to have atrial fibrillation and on oral anticoagulation, namely warfarin. He was admitted through the emergency room uh, with chest pain, and which, which was categorized as unstable angina. So his initial troponins were actually negative. So as usual, we usually try to go radial. Um, his radial pulse was a little weak, but nevertheless, we managed to go in. But surprise, we found that his subclavian was actually occluded. Um, and we ended up uh, 
going um, transfemoral with this gentleman. So when you look at the angiograms, you clearly see a LAD lesion, mid LAD lesion, and a diagonal branch that's actually involved as well. Um, in the areocranial and in the areocaudal, you still see the same uh, lesion once again, but you also see the left main has tubular stenosis. So what we ended up doing is dilating the LAD uh, from you know, the entire segment of the LAD, uh, and we stented the proximal segment as well. So that's what you see in the areocranial, which we preferred. We have a wire just uh, to protect the circumflex coronary artery at this point in time. And we ended up deploying the stent in the left anterior descending artery. And then we moved our attention to uh, the circumflex. So our plan here was we were going to do a DK crush technique. So what you can see is we've wi the wire is still uh, in the circumflex coronary artery. There's a balloon to pre-dilate the circumflex into the left main, and we we'll use the um, balloon as a measuring stick at this point. Um, this is the next slide. We are measuring right now the stent and trying to position it. So there's a stent in the circumflex, and there's a balloon uh, to secure the left main LAD. And what we're doing at in the next um, image is we actually deployed the stent in the circumflex artery. You still see the balloon that's across the stent from the left main into the LAD, which we use to um, pre-dilate. And this is us, we removed the wire from the circumflex, so the circumflex right now is actually bare, and we've crushed, and this is considered the first crush. And then we recross again, and then this in the image that you see on your right-hand side, we're doing a kissing inflation uh, in the LAD and the circumflex. At this point in time, we move on. We move to the LAO cranial. We're trying to position to the ostium of the left main into the LAD. There's no more wire in the circumflex. The image, the RAO caudal view that you see uh, right now, we're deploying the stent, and this is considered the second crush. Once we're done doing the second crush, we rewire and we do, of course, our ballooning. Proximal optimization is key. Uh, after that, we wire, and the proximal optimization helps us uh, negotiate the circumflex itself between the struts. Safest is to go into the LAD and then back uh, into the circumflex when we're recrossing. And then we're doing our kissing inflation that you see in the right-hand screen over here. So this is our uh, second kissing inflation. And we always end with a proximal optimization. And these are the final results of the left main LAD circumflex with um, both areocaudal and areocranial views. And, um, you know, we see a, a very satisfactory results. Usually we should optimize it further uh, after doing intracoronary imaging. So I'm going to stop here. This is the technical aspect, but I think, um, uh, you know, turn it over to you, Tomas, for the discussion on antiplatelets and bleeding risk. Yeah, thank you, Mirvat. So maybe just to summarize, so we have a real HBR patient because he's 80, he has chronic kidney disease, he has warfarin on board, and he was admitted for ACS without troponin release, so namely unstable angina. And you did a really uh, challenging, but with the final uh, perfect result with DK Cruz in the left main. So we have HBR patient, unstable presentation, and highly complex PCI. As you said, when we put the patient in the study, it's very easy. Our life is easy because the randomization will decide it for us. But let's say that now the inclusion are over. So Marco, you will do this, this patient in your practice next week. What will be your, your, your strategy for this, for this particular patient? So first of all, I would like to congratulate Mirvat. It's a great case. Uh, from a technical standpoint, I think it's a really state of the art. And that gives me confidence that actually you can, in a way, uh, go lower with the DAPT duration. Because even if this patient receives uh, one bifurcation stented technique, standing in the left main circumflex as well as proximal AD, still, I think uh, Mirvat did a great case. And the opposition of the stent is very, uh, is very good. Uh, I would probably go for aspirin and clopidogrel for six months, and I would then stop clopidogrel, and I would leave this patient on uh, probably aspirin as well as oral anticoagulation up to uh, one year, and then I would stop everything, and I would leave the patient on VKA alone after one year. That's what I would probably do outside the study. Okay, so you will do six months triple therapy for this for this patient. Probably okay. that's what I would do. Yes, Peter. Do you agree with your with your friend Marco on that? 
Um, well, sometimes it's hard to disagree with Marco, but in this case, I disagree a bit. Um, of course, his patient with high breathing risk, you already mentioned, his age, renal dysfunction, dysfunction and um, on uh, warfarin. So this is already three major criteria, uh, two, two major, one minor criteria. Furthermore, um, a left main crush um, bifurcation treatment in a patient with diffuse coronary sclerosis. It's really challenging. Uh, you have bleeding on one side, ischemic risk on the other side. Um, for me, what counts is um, um, looking at uh, the, the, the location, of course. It's a left main, so high blood flow. Yeah. So the risk of stentral mortis could be a little bit lower than if you are putting it in small vessel and, and then peripheral uh, disease. So uh, that would be a little bit saying in favor of um, uh, not prolonging DAPT too much. But on the other hand, it's diffuse disease, uh, a dub them a double, st a double layer of metal um, in some cases. Um, so I would go to for triple therapy anyhow, but I would limit it to one to three months. Then, um, um, then discontinue aspirin at, uh, um, at one, maybe one or three months. Uh, continue with clopidogrel, I think up to maybe uh, um, uh, six months, actually, and then uh, stop um, uh, clopidogrel as well. Um, and that um, is a little bit different than from what Marco is doing, I think. But eventually, after 12 months, I think we're all on the same line that um, on warfarin only, I think we would be safe enough. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So may maybe just to just to summarize and to give you also my, my view, I fully agree with Marco that thanks to the perfect PCI result, I think that's a key message to say that in HBR patient, if we want to do shorter DIPT, we really have to optimize the PCI result and probably to do imaging in some case and really to be sure to have the best the best uh, angiographic result as, as possible. But in, in this case, I will also go for triple therapy because I don't think that few days of triple therapy in this particular case will be enough, even if it's recently proposed, as we, as we all know. But to me, six, five days probably too short, but six months is probably too long. So I will probably go in same line that, than Peter and to do probably one month triple therapy, then I will drop off aspirin, and I will stop clopidogrel at one year and just to keep a oral anticoagulation. <clears throat> and as long as we have triple therapy, I think it's also important to, to remind that uh, PPI should be, should be all on board because we know that most of the bleed, bleeding in this kind of patient will be, will be GI bleeding. So now that, that you heard our, our view, Mirvat, please, please tell us what you will have done for, the, for this particular case, let's say outside the, the comfort of randomization. Well, similarly, probably continue with triple therapy, um, you know, up to at least three months and then continue with um, double therapy, uh, which would include a vitamin K antagonist given his renal dysfunction. Probably the DOAC or the direct oral anticoagulants are uh, limited in use. And then with probably clopidogrel, not some of the potent, uh, uh, you know, P2Y12 inhibitors. The question in my mind is I'm used to at one year when I go down to monotherapy, it's usually a NOAC. Um, I'm not sure about warfarin, but in this case, again, he does have significant renal dysfunction. So um, it isn't something minor. Um, I have to restrict myself to uh, warfarin and I will have to continue. But generally, I'm more comfortable for monotherapy to be a NOAC. And I'm not sure what the rest of the panel's experience and suggestions there is. Yeah, Marco, Peter, do you want to comment on that? Meaning on the long term, when we decide to stop all the antiplatelet drugs, do you think it's safer to do it with NOAX in, or with vitamin K antagonist? Or you think oral anticoagulation is more or less the same? Uh, well, it's impossible to reply from a scientific standpoint because we do not have evidence. Anyhow, the, uh, the, the data showing that after one year of PCI or ACS, it's probably better to stop any concomitant antiplatelet therapy coming from, uh, came for the first time from a Danish registry where a BKA was used in 95% of the patients. So I would not make a huge difference. So at least I would not be concerned to do this strategy with BKA instead of the work. I would do probably, I would feel myself comfortable anyhow. With both options. Oh, Peter, yes. do, you, do you have? 
Well, of course, we're dealing here with an 80 year old patient with renal dysfunction. And then you could also think if you are thinking about uh, changing to a NOAC, then, then you have to take to, those things into account as well renal dysfunction and in the age, which in some cases for NOACs is an indication to go to a lower dose. And, and actually that combining with, uh, with antibiotics because of the PCI, there we have very little evidence and, um, and maybe, it's, maybe it's not that safe um, to, 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 to do this switch. Um, and um, I would definitely want to switch before the one year. And if I would switch, I would do it after 12, 12 months okay. uh, when all the all, all plated um, inhibitors are, 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 are stopped. And um, and then I think it could be safe to to go for a lower dose uh, in one of the two, or one of the four, um, um, uh, one of the four no, yeah. no works. Okay, just before may, maybe moving to the next case, just coming back to the interaction between the PCI and the HBR status of the patient. So we discussed about the, the PCI results, which will be really optimized in such patients, but about the, the stent choice. And I think that's also something important. Do you think that today, uh, Marco, in 2020, do you think we have to choose some specific stents for HBR patients? Or do you think it's just a class effect and we can use uh, any of the available DES uh, with short DAPT? It's a challenging question, but I would like to have your view. Yeah, it's a challenging question because we don't have the results of study yet. But at the end of the day, there is no clear stand that is shown to be safe with one month DAPT in a properly performed study. This is my reply. Uh, while awaiting for the results of master DAPT, I have been using a lot of ultimaster stent in this uh, patient population, and I am completely comfortable in using ultimaster stent. But I need to say that I've been using also other type yeah. of DS in my practice, and I would also feel comfortable. Anyhow, the comment I would like to raise there is that once the <clears throat> master DAPT study results will be available, I think that results will be highly stent specific. Yeah, I agree. So when you say we don't have evidence, you say that most of the studies performed so far decide short DEPT and after compare DES to bare metal stent. But so far, we don't have study with one stent comparing short and long as it has been. It will be tested in, in master DEPT because as right. you know, many people think that we already have this evidence, but in fact, we don't. No, no, we don't have evidence. The only evidence we have now is coming from single arm registries. And yep. we have seen the synergy stent, we have seen the science stent, basically making the point that one or three months DPT is feasible. But uh, being not a randomized comparison, of course, you do not know the real trade-off between risks and benefit. Only a properly conducted RCT can give you the, this yeah. specific answer. Thank you, Marco, for this uh, nice clarification. So maybe, Mirvat, I, I know that you have a very nice uh, second case to share, so we can go, uh, we, we can go to the second case, please. Sure, so um, case number two, and I think um, I'll get right into it. This is a 70-year-old gentleman, um, diabetic, hypertensive, um, and admitted with initially unstable angina and history of GI bleeding, secondary to pep uh, peptic ulcer uh, disease. But after subsequent to admission, um, within the first few hours, his second troponin level actually went up. So it's not really an unstable angina. It's he's transitioning into a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So um, when we did an echocardiogram for him, his LV function was pres preserved. And his uh, angiograms uh, showed uh, what you see is on the left-hand side, the areocranial, the chosen LAD diagonal lesion. So it's a bifurcation lesion, and the diagonal has a significant disease, and it's a long diagonal. This is the right coronary artery, uh, you know, diffuse disease, but also osteal distal vessel um, stenosis. So in that particular session, what we decided to do is address the uh, LAD diagonal. We decided to dilate the um, mid-LAD segment and use, again, the balloon as a measuring stick uh, to help us determine the length of the stent that we needed. Um, it's very important, given that the diagonal is a sizable diagonal, that any kind of overlap between the stents is going to have to be um, after the ostium of the diagonal to, to ensure that we don't jeopardize it. Um, we did not have the very long stents at that point in time to cover the entire segment, so we had to choose two stents, and that's what we ended up doing. We took a stent, um, placed it in the mid-LAD 
after the ostium of the diagonal, uh, deployed it there, and then we took a second stent and uh, overlapped both segments and um, segments of the stent and deployed that. The um, caudal view that you see on the left, on the right hand side, uh, helps us ensure that we're not encroaching on the left main and so on. So it helps us with the positioning. Um, in this view, you see we're actually deploying the stent and um, doing the proximal optimization in the LAO caudal view. You see our balloon um, doing the proximal opti optimization where we're <coughs> separated we're far from the bifurcation itself. And our initial plan was to do provisional to see if we're going to need it. Clearly, when we stent, we did the stent and we took a picture, you clearly see that the ostium of the diagonal is even worse. Uh, what we ended up doing is crossing into the diagonal uh, with our wire. So once again, similar to the other case, it's always wise to go distal to the uh, branch that you want to negotiate and then on your way back, turn up and cross into it and remove the previous wire. We clearly kept that wire in uh, as a marker for us to help us cross. We did a kissing inflation at that point in time. And again, you can see it in both views, the REO cranial and the LAO caudal. Um, kissing inflation also to prepare the diagonal itself and open the struts. Uh, we ended up delivering the stent. Again, the LAO caudal is a good view to help us position that. We positioned the stent with a balloon already in the LAD itself and deployed that stent. Once the stent was deployed, we uh, come back, we do um, sequential inflations, kissing inflations, and finally proximal optimization that you can see in the right-hand side, uh, areocranial view. And once we were done, we were happy with our results. There was um, excellent TIMI-3 flow in both uh, vessels, the LED and the diagonal. You can see them in um, both views, the areocranial and the, areo and the LAO caudal. So again, this was a master DAPT uh, patient. Uh, and again, I did not have to actually choose um, the um, antiplatelet regimen and duration myself, uh, and we left it to randomization. But in summary, it is a patient who actually has acute coronary syndromes with positive troponins and um, preserved LV function with a two-stent strategy in the LED diagonal. So thank you, Mervat. So it's nice to see that when we think that it's complex to put patients in studies, finally we realize that life is much easier when we just have to decide based on the randomization than clinical decision. So we have a younger patient, which is 70. It's a, it's a non-STEMI patient, diabetics. And uh, again, you did a, a perfect PCI with a nice uh, tap technique on the LAD diagonal. So I will start now with, with Peter. Uh, you have this patient uh, next week. How, what would be your, your discharge strategy for the, for the DAPT in such patient? Okay, thank you, Thomas. Well, first of all, congratulations to uh, Mirfat for doing a beautiful case. I think really one example, a textbook example, how to treat a diagonal LED uh, bifurcation lesion. Um, uh, coming back to the, your question, Thomas, um, indeed, what you already mentioned, an ACS patient, non stemi also um, um, high bleeding risk because of the gut gastric bleed in, bleeding in the past. Um, and then we have this ischemic risk with the bifurcation tap, uh, also uh, from, um, some parts of double stents and uh, later with overlap as well. Um, um, for me, in this case, I would still have the, um, would go for six months DAPT because of the ACS. Um, and I would, because of the ACS, I would uh, um, go for aspirin and Tika Galor for six months, then drop after six months the Tika Galor and continue with the aspirin. Um, and that is a little bit, um, be, yeah, not uh, there was that much evidence to do this, but that is for me um, doing the, the cases and high being with cases with ACS at the moment. Yeah, but I think that beside evidence, people today want also to know what you will do based on the experience. And uh, so I think it's also interesting. So Peter say six months aspirin and ticagrelor and then stop ticagrelor and to keep aspirin. Marco, what will you do for, for, for this challenging patient? Well, I, I need by default to disagree with Peter because otherwise there is no contrast in the discussion. So what I would probably I do here, I would probably do a few months of DBT with aspirin and ticagrelor and I would then stop aspirin and continue ticagrelor. For multiple reasons. First, because I think Takagra is protecting my patient better than aspirin. Secondly, because the patient had a prior GI bleeding. 
So aspirin, of course, is highly connected to GI bleeding and Tecagra actually not at all. Uh, for, for example, Prasuga is much more connected to GI bleeding. So to have Tecagra monotherapy seems to be the best possible sweet spot for this patient, both to compromise for ischemic and bleeding risks. And a yes, few months nice. of DPT probably would be one or three months in this case. Three months? Uh, I, I would do short, if anything, because if I am stopping the APT and I continue with the P2I12 inhibitor, I am very comfortable in going very short. Yeah, so it's nice to see that there is probably no absolute truth because uh, I think it, in my practice, I will probably, as you suggest, discharge the patient with aspirin and potent P2Y12. And I think Ticagrelor or Prasugrel, there is no, no big difference between the two. And after, within the first year, I will probably do de-escalation. And I think we have two options today. One is to keep Ticagrelor as monotherapy, exactly as Marco suggests, to try to reduce the bleeding risk, but with keeping a good ischemic protection. Or we could discuss whether we can switch the P2Y12 and move from Ticagrelor or Prasugrel just to clopidogrel after one or, or, or three months. So I think I will probably do put on the APT in the beginning and try to decrease a little bit the platelet inhibition to keep ischemic protection, but to, to lower the, the risk of bleeding in this specific patient. So Mirvat, what, what, what did you do for this, uh, for this patient? So I actually don't know because this is one of our randomized patients and I- uh, Next week, have... let's say it's next week. What I would do is, as everybody mentioned, probably use a potent P2Y12 inhibitor. Um, I think the question here is going to be for how long for a complex PCI, for a two-tenth strategy, do you want, are you comfortable enough in a patient who is at risk of ischemic um, events? Um, for me, dropping the aspirin is okay, um, and I, but I wouldn't do it early. Um, I would generally, in a low bleeding risk patient, try to continue to a year until the data is out. Um, but since I can't, it's probably at least six months, given that the patient had troponin elevations uh, while in hospital. So um, I yeah. would do at least so, six months of overlap. So we all agree that this patient will be discharged, let's say, with potent DAPT. I think none of us say that I will just give clopidogrel for this patient because of GI bleeding. So it moves us to the next uh, discussion, Peter, because we always speak about HBR like one box. But we know that in this box, there is so many different patients. And compared to the first patient who was AT oral anticoagulation, would you say that this specific patient for the second case is definitely HBR, but it's probably less HBR than the first one presented by Mirvat? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think you're right on this. The first patient had three major criteria to be to be HBR. This patient had one. I think it's also important to know at what uh, what phase the the, the gastric bleeding occurred. Was it longer than a year ago? Was it one month ago? I think that you should can also should take into account. But definitely, and also the new, the latest non STEMI guidelines on the ECS also already identified high bleeding risk risk and very high bleeding risk patients. So there we already see that in the guidelines these kind of differences already are popping up. Whether it is really um, yeah. whether what whether we should change our practice, I don't think we have the evidence yet. No, of course, of course. But just to say that HBR, it's not black and white. It's probably, let's say, more gradual risk of bleeding. Do you want to, to comment more, on that, Marco? More, Do you? More grades of... More no, more I, I, of I completely agree with that. But I would challenge then, Peter. So did you understand what the definition of very high bleeding risk in the guidelines is? Because I read these guidelines at length. I could not find the, the correct definition. They, no, no, these no, guidelines no, make no, three, no. three plots. <laughs> Low bleeding risk, high bleeding risk, very high. And the treatment strategy is completely different based on the stratification, which is never defined in the text. So to be honest, I'm lost. I agree with you. I think the bleeding risk is not black and white. I think there is a continuum of risk. And that's why I honestly think that a score, whatever the score is, and a dummy approach, yes or no, should be combined. That's what my uh, honestly gut feeling is. For example, an OAC patient is, of course, high bleeding risk, but the OAC patient who bled three weeks before and is 85 is a different story than an OAC patient who is 45 and insulin-dependent diabetes with one vessel. So I think the bleeding risk is a continuum. And we are lazy clinicians, but we need to uh, force ourselves to try to use scores or at least to integrate the multiple coverage in our mind automatically because their bleeding risk is absolutely continuum and actually changes over time as well. 
Yeah, but I think the two cases presented by Mervat were, were a great example of that because in the first one, all of us proposed very short DEPT, all of us proposed clopidogrel. And for the second one, which was HBR as well, I think we all proposed longer and more potent. Uh, so it was, I think it was very, very good case selection, thanks to Mirvat, to, to illustrate this uh, exactly the, this concept. I so completely I think the, agree. Uh, sorry, 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 Thomas. No, please, please, Marco, please, please go ahead. No, I agree, but I think the, the, the decision between the type of P2A12 mutator here was very easy because if you have OAC on board, it's very difficult to give anything else but clopidogrel. Every time there are small studies testing it, you always see a slight excess of bleeding risk, even if you drop aspirin and you associate OAC, for example, with Tecagro, we have more data with Tecagro. I don't think the data are reassuring at all. So I think the, the choice is very simple. Yeah, thank you, Marco. So again, thanks a lot, Mirvat, for the great case uh, selection. And I think because we had a lot uh, of discussion, thanks to the case, I think it's now uh, time for, for Peter to, to just give us the, let's say, the wrap up or the key learning of, uh, of the session. Please, Peter. Thank you, Thomas. Um, indeed, I think we have seen two beautiful cases and a nice, very nice discussion. And if I can have the next slide. Um, Good, this is my uh, conflict of interest. Next slide. So um, what would be my uh, approach in those patients with high bleeding risk? First of all, I think it's very important that we start to identify the patients which, which are high bleeding risk and whether you use the ARC HBR criteria or the, you, you do the precise depth. And anyhow, I encourage people to, to uh, abide to one of those two mm, mm, uh, techniques or to do risk scores. Uh, to identify your patients. And if you have identified that patient, then of course a radial approach is, is, is the, the best way to, to start. And if possible, keep the procedure simple like uh, Mirfa did in the second case. Try to do a provisional um, uh, bifurcation treatment if, if, um, uh, if possible. Um, and then, um, then the, the stent selection is of course still a, a matter of debate. I will touch on that a little bit further on on the next slide. And then uh, the tailoring the DPT should be, um, should be of course, of uh, great importance. And you should take two things into mind, uh, whether the patient has concomitant ORC or NOAC, and maybe also what is the clinical presentation. Um, so um, what should I do with a patient not on OAC or NOAC? I would consider at least three to six months DAPT, um, as discussed uh, in, this, as, as in the second case. And if a patient is still in, on OAC or on NOAC, still consider triple therapy. The duration, we don't know. Should it be one month? Should it be more than th up to three months or even longer? I think we have to await more data. And uh, anyhow, we should at least consider a six months dual therapy in most cases. And, um, and that is also for debate because that has also no evidence yet. Um, so far, uh, 12 months is what is normally in the guidelines, but six months, I think we think can go, can go down in HBR patients. But um, the next, uh, our master DAP trial will uh, show hopefully some evidence on this. If, you can, if we can continue one more slide, then we, this is kind of an overview of all the of the DPT trials in HBR patients. On the left, you have the single arm registries, as Marco mentioned. You have the, the, the studies that have only that a single arm study and compare it to a historical control. And on the right, you see the real randomized clinical trials. And in some cases, they are only they are comparing different stents in the same uh, DAPT regimen. And we have only two studies that are actually looking at the different therapy and using the same stent. And for that, I, you can really clearly see that in magnitude, uh, of the trials, mass DPT is really the largest one uh, to show uh, what is the best evidence. And next slide, please. Then you will see what the, the mass DPT is all about. It's 4,300 HBR patients, all common A3 administration, global study, and both were randomized after one month. And if you have a patient is on the ORC or no ORC, after one month's triple, T, tri triple therapy, those patients were randomized to an abbreviated um, uh, arm or a prolonged DPT arm. And the abbreviated means that you stopped a triple therapy after one month and you continue dual therapy up to six months and then you stop. 
and the tri and the prolonged was the uh, triple therapy up to three months and even or maybe up to six months depending on the operator. At 12 months, everyone stops the 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 the, the, the P2 by 12 receptor blocker and um, and only ORC or NOAC was continued. On the lower end, there's the patients not on ORC or NOAC. Patients were randomized after one month, and then um, at that moment, at one month, the single antiplatelet therapy was continued. So one of the um, P2R12 receptors mostly were, were dropped, or aspirin was dropped, and then single antiplatelet therapy was continued. And then on the other, on the lower end, the conventional arm, where we have give DPT dual therapy for at least six to twelve months. So those trials will really, this trial will really show one, two important key features. Is it, phase, is it safe to stop at six months the um, dual therapy in a patient on ORC and NOAC? And is it safe to have only one month triple therapy? And on the lower arm, is it safe to um, st stop dual, ther um, uh, dual therapy after one month and start uh, giving single interplate therapy after one month? Um, and um, I think that's the most important key issues of this trial. Thank you. Thomas. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for this nice, uh, let's say, practical messages and, and meaning that we are really looking forward to the result of the master DPT study because it will hopefully and definitely change the, the practice in the field because, as you said, for the first time, we'll have appropriately side therapy study comparing two different DPT with the same stent, which will completely differ from the from the previous uh, studies. So again, thanks again to Mirvat, Marco, and Peter for this uh, for this nice uh, session and discussion. I hope also people who uh, review the session and uh, get connected for the session uh, enjoyed it. And uh, we'd like also to thank uh, Terumo who support this uh, educational session. So again, thanks a lot and stay safe and see you soon, hopefully. Bye.